everyone, it's Mary Catherine from Kohler and Dram, and today we are here again with Allison, and I'm super excited because today we are going to be talking about her new book, which is called Falling Into Flowers. Um, we received this book in the mail, and we went wild about it. Um, I really enjoyed looking through the photos because the photos in this are so beautiful. Um, oh. As you can see, like you open up to the title page and look at that. They're all, there's photos all throughout the book. There's even a cute, cute dog in there, just for all my dog lovers <laughs> there. I noticed that right away. Um, and the book is all about like running a, a, an event business, a floral wedding business. Um, and I love it because right away you open it up and the table of contents is right there. It's well organized. You've got lists, you've got um, how to's. And it's really all about like keeping your flower event business going, which I really, really love, love, love. So mm -hmm. today we're going to dive in to all about falling into flowers with Allison. Yay, I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, thanks for uh, jumping, jumping on with us today. Um, you know, my first question for you was like, what inspired you to kind of like, start this project because like taking on a writing a book is not a small thing it's not a small thing you know it's funny i yesterday was looking through some notebooks so i'm big on i'm big on goal setting i'm big on um dreaming in your business and so when we're recording this it's december end of the year and it's that time where it's sort of like do or die time. It's like, am I going to just roll into the holidays and not be motivated? Or am I going to like really be future focused and think about like planning ahead in my business? So I am choosing the latter, even though I want to just curl up in, under a blanket. Um, and what I did is I found these notebooks a few weeks ago I put, and I could just tell they were like a time capsule of my goal setting from years ago. So anyway, I pulled them out and I was just sort of, you know, like when you're, it's almost like reading an old diary. Like you're like, I kind of want to read this, but I'm afraid of who I was, you know? And I pulled it out yesterday. And don't you know, one of the things on the list, like, what do you want to do? It was like, this was probably about an eight year old list. And one of the things was sell books. <laughs> and like monetize my knowledge. That was like one of the things on the list. So I always wanted to write a book. I know I wanted to write a book years ago. And like even just eight years ago, I wasn't thinking about writing a book for florists. I was write, thinking about writing a book for people planning a wedding, right? For couples mm -hmm. with beautiful pictures and, you know, here are tips for planning a wedding. Here's ideas for centerpieces. Like that's the book that I was imagining myself writing when I did this goal setting all those years ago. So when it came, it came to life because I was approached by Travis from Florist Review who said, do you want to write a book? Do you want to put your articles that you've, because I've been writing articles for a couple of years for Florist Review magazine. Would you want to put those into a book? So it was you know, one of the reasons why I'm so crazy about goal setting is because when you do it, right, then when someone comes to you and says, do you want to write a book? You don't go, do I have time for that right now? Um, I'm not sure if I'm qualified. I don't know if I'm ready. You just go, yes, because it's been part of the dream all along. So it was a no brainer to say yes. And I feel really lucky that I had the opportunity to have somebody who wanted to publish me like for real you know i always figured i'd write a book and i'd self-publish um so you know I, I feel fancy that i have an actual real book with a hard cover on it it's kind of exciting it's beautiful too the design that went into it the, everything is very thoughtfully done um it's it's just a really gorgeous book and we're super excited to have it so um i also wanted to ask you who it's for like who's your intended audience so I was talking to um, a, a client that I'm doing some freelance work for the other day, um, and we were talking about her brand and what she wants to accomplish and some of her goal lists, because um, I'm also kind of on that bandwagon with you where I think goal setting is super important. And to your point too, like it makes it easier to say yes to a big project like this if you've done that 
that goal setting ahead of time. But she has a full service shop right now, but she really wants to specialize in weddings and events down the road, but she's not 100% sure how to take that leap. So would you say that she's someone who could benefit from a book like this or, or who's the audience that this book is for? Wait, you're like, I, can I carry you around with me everywhere I go? Like, <laughs> she is the perfect person for this book. You know, this, the way I view this book is for anybody who loves flowers and wants to do flowers as their business, not for hobby people. <laughs> if you just love flowers for fun, this isn't for you because it's really about the business stuff. So it's not about design. Design is such an important aspect of what we do as florists. Like it's the no brainer, obvious piece. You have to know how to design, right? But the book is really about all the other pieces that are critical to allowing you to keep doing that design, right? So pricing, closing the sale, like once the customer comes to you and you have that consultation, how do you get them to yes? That's what I teach in this book. And then, you know, even more than that, how do you get them to you in the first place? Because <laughs> it's all, you know, they're all interwoven. You have to price right if you want to stay in business. But you have to close the sale if you're going to get the customer to pay you. And you have to bring the right customer to you in order to close the sale, in order to get the money so that you stay in business. So it's not enough to just be great at design. It's not enough to just have a great website. It's not enough to just know how to price you really have to know how to do all these things together. Um, and yeah, I would, I would love for your client to check out my book because I think, I think it will be exactly the things that you need. When you have a shop, things are, you do things differently than when you have a, a weddings focused business, right? Because just because you have to, <laughs> just because of the, the nature of the beast. When weddings are what you want to focus on, then you can get really targeted in how you really speak to customers. When you, when you have a shop, you're trying to reach a, a larger group of people, right? It could be anybody, right? I could sell flowers to anybody. When you're doing weddings, um, it's just more nuanced in a way that makes it easier to reach your target market because you're not trying to please all the people. You're just looking for people who are like, getting married in the next 18 months or 24 months or whatever. And um, you, can, you can tap into like what's making them tick right now. There's a certain psychology um, that goes on while you're planning your wedding that is not true for you at any other time in your life. <laughs> <laughs> it's very true. So what was the inspiration behind the book? Really, my inspiration behind the book and really, you know, everything that I do, all my courses that I make, is Flores being able to be profitable and successful. You know, having freedom in your business. A lot of florists love the design part so much, but they don't like the business part. They almost even brag about how they're not good at the business part. It's almost like a little badge of honor, like, oh, I'm terrible at the business part but you don't have to be, you really can learn. If you can learn how to design, you can learn how to do business stuff. <laughs> design takes a certain sort of inherent talent that goes with it. Um, business is kind of like, just follow some rules and you're, you're kind of doing, you're doing things the right way. It's not, it's not as free form. So that's really what I want to do is help florists feel less bogged down by their business and more empowered. Mary, did you have a question you were going to ask? Well, something I really loved is that the way the book is kind of, um, the way you flow through the book is right away it talks about how to become a wedding florist. So I love that because maybe you are, or maybe you're like on the verge of taking that leap. And I love that you started with that because sometimes, you know, you, you're like, should I do it? Should I not do it? I'm, I love it, but do I love it? Do I, do I really love it? Um, and then you go, I love the next thing that you do is you talk about finding your, your niche, your niche. Um, because I think like we were talking about before where you have a flower shop, you're going to anyone and taking everyone. Whereas like you were saying events, it's a lot more niche driven. Um, so I really, really, really appreciated the fact that that was the second chapter, like right away. You're kind of, um, you're, you're, the organization is like, it's bringing you down through the 
thought process of how you're really going to build on it. And it's um, beautiful because then you go to how to sell a wedding, which, right? Doesn't the everyone want to know? That's, you know, when people, so I love that you, I, I like that you like the layout of it because I really do too. It's, I want things to be logical and make sense. And there isn't one right way to become a wedding florist. That's just the bottom line. You know, in, even just in Europe, right? There's a much clearer way of how you become a florist in most European countries. They have certifications, right? You go to school. Um, I think I can be honest and say this. They, they kind of shun you if you didn't go to school. You're not qualified, right? Here in the States, right? Different. You could just become a florist because, you know, you're, you did one wedding and people thought it was great. And now you're like, I'm a florist, right? It, there isn't a like, I mean, of course we have AIF, of course we have certification, but it's not like you have to be certified in order to serve clients. And so that's really, you know, the other intention, you know, aside from Flora's being empowered, is serving clients better because, you know, there isn't a way to learn how to do this stuff. Even, even people who work in flower shops for many years, right? They're like, I'm branching out on my own and I have my first consultation. What do I do? They don't know because you've never done it before. Maybe you didn't see it at the shop or your shop did it a way that you didn't really it didn't jive with you <laughs> and that's part of that personal flair that we're all going to figure out everyone is going to become a florist in a different way you know i became a florist well i took my first design class actually when i was in fifth grade i took a summer camp um workshop that it's like a five-week workshop and they had a fresh flower design class and i signed up for it and loved it it was everything. And then when I was 16 and looking for a job, I'm from New Jersey. And so obviously you go to the mall to look for a job in the nineties in New Jersey. So I went to go looking for a job. I applied everywhere, you know, clothing stores, pizza places, and nobody called me back. And my mom noticed a sign at the flower cart in the mall that they were hiring. She said, you know, remember you liked that class back in fifth grade? Maybe you want to apply here. They're the only people who called me back. You know, it was, it was kismet. It was fate. Um, meant to be. <laughs> without a doubt meant to be. Uh, Cause I definitely apply. I probably applied to like 50 places and not even one person called me. Um, but you know, it was great to get training, right? Like the first thing I did was trained for several months. My friends who got jobs at other places, they trained for a couple weeks, right? It was months of training to, fit, to learn what I needed to learn to be fully self-sufficient and run this little flower cart all by myself, you know? Then I worked in flower shops. So I got to see different ways. I worked in shops for years before I worked at a shop that did weddings. <laughs> for years before I found one shop that actually did weddings. So, you know, it wasn't until 2001 when I did my first wedding and I had been working in shops for years and years at that point. Mm -hmm. um, but I fell in love with it and I learned a lot, you know, about how to design weddings, but I didn't learn anything about closing the sale from working at shops like that that was all on me once i had my own business i had to figure out how do i present this proposal so that they'll accept it what are my contract terms you know like what what do they have to agree to and what do i do if they don't call me back or get back to me like how do i follow up to close that sale and it's it's a it's a process that's for sure well, and something I want to remind um, the people who are watching this right now is that we did do a video um, with you. So we can link that also. Um, and that does go into a little bit more detail about how, um, of just tips and tricks that you have for doing those um, things as well too. So when people are watching this, if they missed it, yes. it's okay because it's, it's on. So it's up and ready for you guys when you are ready to watch it.
um, as well. So Allison, can you kind of walk us through your thought process a little bit? Because I find, and this is not exclusive to the floral industry by any means, but sometimes you find that veterans in whatever field that they have kind of become experts in are very like reluctant to, to share their knowledge and they're very protective of their experience and very, they want to keep their, you know, those industry secrets, if you will, sort of, um, to themselves and there, you know, there's not a whole lot of that, you know, professional level to beginner education, but you are very open. You're very willing to share all of your knowledge. You want to help other florists succeed. Whereas I, that isn't necessarily um, something that's common among, you know, veteran people within any industry. They, they're very protective of their knowledge and they, I mean, maybe it's a, coming from a place of feeling threatened by up and comers, but you don't seem to have that at all. So can you walk us through your thought process and why you choose to share your knowledge with, with everyone? You want, it seems like you just want everybody to succeed, which is fantastic. I do. I do want people to succeed because I think because I know how hard it is when you're alone, right? Like I work alone. Like <laughs> I get it, you know? Um, I was lucky that pretty early on in my uh, business ownership, I met another florist in my area who was also new. She was even newer in her um, ownership of her business. But we should have been competitors. We were we served the same market. We even got inquiries from the same people. We're like, you get that inquiry from Tiffany? Yeah, I did too. You know, um, but we became really strong allies. We talked, it started with like a phone conversation one day, and then became like, mm, let me call her again. And then she would call me. And it became like every day, like pretty long conversations actually where we were basically each other's business, um, you know, per, like you guys, somebody to bounce the ideas off of, right? So that you can collaborate and make your business stronger, even though we were competitors. And I think through just, you know, the practical, real life, um, just experience of not being afraid to like educate my competition or get educated by my competition to bounce ideas off of each other. Uh, it sort of took away any fear of like, well, if somebody knows what I know, they're going to beat me or, you know, I'm going to lose what I have if somebody else gets up the ladder. Um, I mean, I've even, I'm even working with a student this year um, with one-on-one -on -one coaching who's in a town that does a ton of weddings. And I was like, I think you're awesome. She's a grower. I'm like, I think you're awesome. I will coach you and you might take my business away, right? <laughs> Not really her plan. But you know, we have our moments where you're like, oh no, am I training my competition? Um, but when you have so, when you have so much to give, Emily, I mean, when you just have so much to give. Yes. Um, I really love talking about business and I love talking about the flower business and I don't know what I would do if I couldn't share this stuff. I think that's why I share it because it's like, it's gotta come out. It's just gotta. I think it's really refreshing too, to have somebody like you in an industry like this too. Um, I mean, if you look at the big picture too, sharing your knowledge can only change the entire industry for the better. So you, some people might look at the small picture and say, I'm educating my competition. I'm gearing them up to, to beat me. You know, but if you look at the big picture, the overall industry can only get better with knowledge sharing. So I, I think like any industry it, that's probably true for, and you're, you're just working towards the betterment of the, of the entire business. So kudos to you, Allison. I think that's amazing. Well, you know, for me, I think when we work so hard as florists, because it's, you know, people go, oh, it must be so nice. You're with flowers all day. <laughs> How many hours did you sit in front of your computer today, though, where you weren't with the flowers, you know? So it's, it is so nice. It is. I love my job, you know? I really do. But it's also really, really hard and stressful work. Like, if you take what we do seriously, it's the biggest day of somebody's life that you're involved in. And if, you know, as you know, on your end, right, if those orchids didn't come in just right, or something is delayed, and now I have to start designing a day late, it's a big deal. <laughs> and so while it's like, we're just making pretty, and we're just, you know, um, we're just florists. It's, we're just in the happy business. We're actually, you know, we feel, we feel that pressure. Um, and we really do need to be empowered to 
draw boundaries to know what's what's good to say yes to and what is like no i don't do that how to manage our own workload right like all that stuff it really comes through practice and it comes through trial and error and what i hope is you know like with my book with all the free stuff i do with my courses that you can get enough information where you really do feel empowered, where you really do feel like you can say no to that thing that you, that doesn't light you up, that you have in your mind, well, here's how I'm going to serve my client better. Because what happens when we're not self-educated, because we have to seek this out ourselves. There's no one who's going to come and be like, here is all you need to know. And you are now granted with the knowledge, right? When we seek it out, what I sought out when I really wanted to drill down on, how do I get better customers? How do I get as good as the florists who were doing better than me at the time? And what I realized was it really started with getting, attracting them in the first place. <laughs> that was the thing, how do I attract them? Because if they don't get attracted to me, I don't even get the chance to write the proposal and get the yes, because they never even thought I was a good contender, right? And that came down to really drilling into who am I, right? Who am I? Who do I serve? Who are the customers? And getting really obsessed with my customers, getting really obsessed with, like not in a psycho way, but <laughs> in, a, in a putting them up on a pedestal way, right? Who are they? What do they need? And what do I do that's unique to these customers? And once I did that, that is when I was able to see that change from why am I not getting these inquiries or booking these great weddings to wow, every client I am excited to work with, they all respect me. No one asked me for five meetings. No one was rude or short with me, you know, and year after year, you just, once you start attracting the right customers, you get better at attracting more of the right customers. And it just, it starts to build from there. Well, I think that's really great advice too, because so right now we're kind of in Minnesota, we're on a pause because of COVID. And um, so people are a little bit more hesitant to throw weddings and do receptions, but like this is a perfect opportunity as a florist in the floral industry, in the event industry to really, you know, think about what you just spoke about of who am I attracting? Do I like the customers that I'm bringing in? Do I want a higher goal? Do I want people with $10,000 budget instead of a $500 budget? I think those are all really great questions to be asking yourself, especially now because you, you do have space to breathe. Um, and yeah, you can be sending out proposals and still um, business doesn't shut down when business shuts down. Right. There's social media, you can do email. There's so many ways to connect with um, your audience. But again, going back to what you said about really honing in on what you want. Um, I think the more clear you are about that within yourself, your branding then also becomes way more clear. This is a great time to do some strategic planning. Like even as the company, um, us here at Cooler and Dram have been doing some of that um, as a management group too. So it's a great time to kind of take a step back and look at your business and your strategy and everything as a whole. Um, and Mary, like you were saying too, kind of decide where you're going. What is your brand saying? Who do you want to attract? This is the perfect time for strategic planning. If you're not, I mean, granted we're heading into the holidays, so we're probably gonna have some busy times coming up here, but um, with COVID, this was a great time to just take a step back and analyze where you're at, set some goals, like we were talking about earlier, decide where you wanna go. Because right now, you have the time. You can take a step back and like Mary said, breathe and really figure out your strategy. It's, you know, I, for me, I feel like I actually haven't had any breathing room and it's by self-design, right? And so that's something we need to look at. Like if you're listening to Emily and you're going, well, I haven't breathed, Okay, well, if you haven't breathed yet, all right, I'm with you, I'm with you, but it's because we're doing it to ourselves, you know? What I, something that struck me the other day is the idea of being the visionary in your business. Leaders are visionaries, right? And too many times we're the worker bees, guilty, okay, guilty. But like, I don't have somebody else writing my blog posts 
or making my infographics, even though I should, right? Um, we need to be the visionaries. And so that was sort of, I sort of drew this line really December 1st, you know, <laughs> like, okay, it's visionary time. It's not worker bee time right now. It's not time to be like, what's the next thing I need to update on my website? Even though you know I'm obsessed with updating. I, trust me, I say that I updated it like literally like six weeks ago, okay? So it's not like it's two years or something. But instead of the busy work, which I can easily assign myself, right? Oh, you have to do this, you have to do that. It's visionary time. What is in the future? And it is, things are on hold. I think more than the business is on hold, the wedding planning is on hold. And rightly so, by the way, you know, we, cause we have flowers go, I'm getting ghosted. Nobody's booking. Okay. So let's just pause for a minute on that. I am feel better about the sanity of your client who's not booking than the sanity of your client. Who's like, yep, we're moving forward in February. Right. right. Like, whoa. 200 people. Like, <laughs> what? <laughs> So like, you know, it's that like, be careful what we wish for thing, right? Do you really want to have people on the books that are then going to postpone when they realize that when May comes around or June comes around, they're wearing masks, they're not having 200 guests, you know, better to be like my prediction, if we can get into prediction mode, where's my like crystal ball, um, I think 2021, I think January and February and probably March are when we're going to book up our entire 2022 calendar. That's genuinely what I, I mean, hope, <laughs> but also what I think is going to happen because people who would have gotten married in 2021, but for COVID, they're going to wait. They're like, we didn't pick, book a venue. We haven't started planning yet. We're just going to have a long engagement. As soon as January rolls around or February, it's going to click now. It's like the gates are going to open up. Now is the time to pick a date, get a venue, get your vendors, and people should be ready. They should be ready for how do you, you know, this is, that's like what my, like my email templates and my wedding templates that I sell are really made to help you do. How do you not spend three hours on that quote? Because then you don't get upset when they don't come back, right? If you can do it in an hour or less, it's not going to break your heart that you're getting ghosted right now. So when we can be really clear with people like how this is going to work, we can book them, keep our sanity, hopefully. And, you know, we are going to have a little bit of tumult in 2021. Right. I it's know there are people already canceling some of their 2021 right. weddings because they got married in 2020. And so they go, am I really going to have a $200,000 wedding? I already am married. And that's going to be something we're dealing with too. We, we have, a, we have a, things to look forward to that are going to be optimistic soon and also some fallout still. And it's a mixed bag and such is life, right? Such right. Is life. It's been a long road and it's been, a, I think, a very challenging road for a lot of people this year. Um, I, although I think you're right. I think there, there's good news on the horizon. I think we are going to see sort of a bounce back, especially in the wedding industry. Um, it wasn't that long ago that I saw a prediction report from, um, I think it was someone in the events industry, wedding and events industry, that, and it showed a line chart. In 2020, obviously, it was like this crash and burn moment where COVID hit and all of a sudden everything got canceled. And then there were shutdowns. And so it flatlined at the bottom and there was nothing going on. Um, and looking at numbers going into to next year, it's a, a very strong spike. Uh, it's, uh, you know, because people who canceled this year are rescheduling for next year. Now, I think obviously there's going to be lasting effects of COVID. I think you're right. The first few months of the year are still going to be a little bit of a struggle, but um, going into next summer, especially, I mean, if not to get political, but like with the vaccine potentially on the horizon here, we all have to be prepared for that. And that does factor into businesses too. So I think taking this moment to kind of plan ahead and try to strategize for, for what's coming um, is really, really important. Yes. How will you make it through, you know, 2021? You're, you're, it's basically whatever we make in 2021 is what we made in 2020 and 2021 for the people who really do events, you know, for the florists with the storefronts, for the florists who pivoted to, 
you know, doing deliveries and weeklies. I mean, hats off to you. You know, you, <laughs> they, they're doing all right. You know, it's the people who like niched down, right. <laughs> into weddings where we're like, ouch, you know? Um, but I, I'm committed to weddings, you know, I, and I, this is what I love. Um, I don't even say I do weddings and events so much as I do weddings because I don't really do events. I do weddings. <laughs> and, you know, for a really long time, it was weddings and events, weddings and events, weddings and events. And again, you know, you look at yourself, you do the plan, you strip down and you go, it's not events, it's weddings, Allison. Just get it together. <laughs> selling here, you know? And it makes everything easier then. The language is easier too. I don't have to say and events, I'm just weddings. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm all in and I'm all in on weddings and I'm very hopeful that 2021 will, will continue, like that people aren't going to cancel who postponed from 2020, um, but I'm buckling up. That's where I'm, where I'm at. Well, the thing, one of the things in the book that I really enjoyed, um, and this kind of just like, I'm a list maker. Mm -hmm. um, and I think this is something else that we like as events are booking up and as a florist, like if you book four weddings in, in one day for 2021, like this list, um, it is called wedding production schedule for a oh, I, I gonna... floral budget. Um, the page itself is gorgeous. But I think something um, that is so key is that when you are starting to really book all these weddings um, and receptions, because now we're hearing a lot of people got married in 2020, but they want, they still want that reception, right? They still want that wow factor with their families. Um, yeah, because even for me, my cousin, he got married and I was really sad that I couldn't be there. But the thing that all of us had to look forward to is we know that there's going to be a reception. We know we can celebrate them in some way together um, eventually. But this... Um, this list is so great because it has pre-wedding week then you have Tuesday. Um, it says even, I love it because it says fill water buckets, um, get your hydrangeas cut, your roses, your greenery, double check all your supplies. Like it's just things that like, you know, you're busy, you're on your schedule, but then it has Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday tear down. I mean, how amazing this checklist is that you made, um, I, think I love really, that checklist too. Oh my gosh, yeah. And I think it's going to be um, key for people who are really, really starting to get into this more, especially with planning, because maybe that means that you have to bring in some help. Like you ask the teenagers who love to stay up late, like, hey, if I pay you 20 bucks, will you like drive over and pick this up? You know what I mean? Like, so really planning out in December and even in January when we know it's a little bit more relaxed. Um, to really start thinking about like ways you can utilize it. Cause again, like you said, you need to be a leader in your company and not necessarily always doing the grunt work. Right. Of course there are days where you have to wash the buckets and pick up the flowers and like get dirty and all that jazz. But I think also knowing when you can outsource is so important too. Yeah. And being able to that zooming out, you know, the thing I love about that checklist, I mean, the photo is my favorite, but the thing I love about it it's a checklist for a $10,000 wedding that I did. And I know for, you know, for some florists who do lots and lots of big luxury weddings, it's like a $10,000 wedding isn't that much. And they think, I find that a lot of florists who do big weddings also kind of think like everybody does big weddings. Many, 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 many florists will never do a $10,000 wedding in the first 10 years of their business, or they may live in an area where that's just not done, right? Like, so I think that it's important to um, really recognize everyone's got a different, I, I'm Jersey, I say niche, but niche, um, <laughs> has a different area where they're going to be comfortable. Some people um, like you said earlier, you know, some people are going to have a $500 floral budget and what can you do with that? You know, um, other people are going to have 10,000 as like a you know, 10,000. Is that enough? And other people are going to be 50,000 for flowers, right? So there's always going to be people who need servicing in different areas of the market. But when you do have like multiple events or something that's bigger than you're used to, like I remember when a $3,000 wedding was like a big deal for me. Now I'm like, oh, it's just a $3,800 wedding, no problem, 
you know? Um, and I think that's, I feel like that's such an insider floristy kind of thing too, to be like the dollar amount tells you how big the job is, but it, but it does, you know, it's, it's the number of pieces get, get bigger with the bigger ticket item, right? Or the bigger sale on a $10,000 wedding that might be a big wedding, or you might barely be able to do what you want because they have a $10,000 budget, but they have $20,000 dreams, right? So I never like to judge a budget just at a glance. It's what do they want for that budget that tells you whether or not it's a good budget. But with the schedule, what I like about it is if you're doing two weddings, if you're doing three weddings, like I looked at my schedule with all my reschedules and I'm like, not looking forward to June and July, if I'm being honest, it's <laughs> not how I would set up my life the way I've been for many, many years now. Like I would never take this many weddings in this short of a time, but that's where things start to slip through the cracks, right? Where you're like, oh, I'm out of corsage pins or oh, I'm out of um, whatever it is. It's always something little, but it's a huge deal. Like if you're out of boutonniere and corsage pins, you're toast. You got to go get them. <laughs> That's it. There's no finishing this wedding without it. You need a special color ribbon, right? You want to have those things figured out ahead of time. So not waiting until the week of the wedding to figure this stuff out. And then like having a schedule, like I do this on this day. I when I was just working out of my kitchen, out of my second story apartment, and even when I moved to our house here, everything started on Thursday because I didn't have a cooler. Mm -hmm. So Thursday, I got the flowers. And then all day Thursday, I'm cleaning flowers. And then I'm like schlepping them into my basement. And then I'm schlepping them out of the basement. And I'm, now it's like, I could start on a Tuesday. I might design on a Wednesday. It makes a huge difference to just realize like, oh, you know what? Those roses aren't actually going to die between Thursday and Saturday. I can pick them up on Wednesday. So, you know, just even having that little permission, like, yes, you can make boutonnieres on Wednesday if you want to, right? Um, it's a little, little treasure in the, in the schedule. I love that we're talking about clients kind of on all ends of the spectrum because, and, and florists on all end of the spectrum then too, because there are clients who have those, the little budgets, there are clients with the big budgets and there are clients who have champagne taste on a beer budget, you know? So it kind of, it, it covers the, the whole range of designers and of clients. So I guess getting back to your book here too, um, what do you hope people who pick it up and read it are going to get out of it? What is in there for florists who are on all ends of the spectrum or fall kind of, you know, within a range? I, I hope that experienced florists will feel like validated, right? Like that they'll have the confirmation mm -hmm. that yes, they're doing all these things. Even if they're experienced, I hope they'll pull out a nugget or two of, um, you know, something to add to their process, something, a way of pre-qualifying clients, for example, a way of making a connection. Like when I weed out clients by pre-qualifying, I'm actually bringing them in under my wing. I, I, I do it in a way that's inviting, not in a way that's like, here's a hurdle for you to jump over. Um, but yet it still does the same thing for me of helping to weed out not the right clients. So I hope they can walk away with tips like that. And I think for brand new florists or home-based studio florists who are, even if they're not new, but they're having trouble sort of, just like, like I did years ago, just having this moment where you're like, I'm better than I appear. I'm better in real life. The service people get, the, the way I make them feel, the work I do is better than what it appears to be just from a glance at my website. I need to like be able to communicate that better. I need to be able to get that message out more. I hope that those newer florists or home studio florists who are just like at a plateau will get some tips that help them just like, just bust, break on through to the other side, you know? 
So um, why is it a good addition to any floral library and how is it different than other books? So we have, we have some other books here at Kohler and Dram too that we have and um, they kind of run the gamut from different styles of design, but we do have a, a number of wedding design books. And I know that yours is intentionally like by design, not about design. So we've talked about that a little bit already. So we know that that is kind of a key difference, but what sets this book apart from other design books or other wedding floral books? The real thing for me, I, I feel based, especially just on the feedback that I'm getting, is just how it is very modern and clear in terms of this is how we run a business now. There's not, it's not old fashioned, you know, I don't talk about brides and grooms. I tell you, make sure your language is inclusive, you know, things like that, where you need to be really aware that you're running a business in, I mean, it's almost the end of 2020. We can't even say you're running a business in 2020. You're running a business in 2020. We're beyond that. <laughs> and there's a certain way that people um, expect to be dealt with. And there's a certain um, level of like mystery that is gone, right? From the way that people plan weddings because there's Pinterest. They can Google anything. Um, they can find out all kinds of things. The knot is more than willing to tell them what the average right. floral budget is, right? Which none of us agree with, but that's what they're <laughs> willing to set there. They can find those things. So we need to know how to um, really build trust with clients in, in a short window of time. Um, and I really do think that's what will, this book will help you do aside from making sure you know like here's some basic pricing stuff y'all just you might already know this but just in case like here's some pricing stuff and make sure you're keeping your your profits but here's how you're really gonna move to the next level in your business um simply by you know kind of looking inward i hope this book helps people look inward um because it's very easy for us I don't want to say just florists because I think it's probably a lot of service businesses. It's very easy to start blaming the customer, right? Mm -hmm. They're uneducated. They have unrealistic expectations. Like, ooh, I hate these ugly things that people say about our customers, right? I'd love for this book to help bring people back to loving the customer, loving on that customer, because they are so critical to what we do that we can't take them for granted or snub them as being uneducated or unrealistic um, before we even had a chance to like woo them and close the sale. I think that's an interesting point too. It's coming from um, working in the wedding industry myself for a number of years too, I can say that, you know, comparatively, today versus 10 years ago, there is a much higher level of transparency expected on the, on the part of the client. You know, brides and grooms or brides and brides or grooms and grooms or whoever your market is, is coming in and they, you know, especially with organizations like The Knot and like Pinterest, like you mentioned, Allison, there is definitely a level of transparency and openness that, that the expectation is set for these days. It's much less you know, sort of that smoke and mirrors type of business like it was 10, 15 years ago. So yeah, you're 100% right that there's this expectation that clients have and we have to figure out how to cater to them with this kind of this new atmosphere in the wedding business because it's not the same as it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago. Not at all. It's really, really not. And for everyone who goes, you know, oh, Pinterest, right? It's so easy <laughs> to come down on Pinterest. I remember what it was like to sell flowers before Pinterest. And there was a whole lot of, trust me, um, I've never made that before, but I can, you know, um, I was, we were cutting things out of magazines before Pinterest. Right. Yeah. It's a gift. It's not it was a still Pinterest. It was just the paper version. <laughs> got it. And like, this gives us, like, I always say when there's, when a client comes to me, with you know their pinterest board or their vision and i'm pricing you know giving them a quote based on what they want it's not me who made it expensive it's them who made it expensive <laughs> with what they're requesting and i think that they actually own that more i think they under they actually understand that more that they came to you with this picture and this is what that picture costs and that's why this quote is this price it's not just um it's just 
it's not as uh, out in the like, just trust me, <laughs> like it used to be. It's like, oh, you like this picture? This picture costs this. If you want 20 of them, it's gonna cost this. And then they can sort of accept that in a different way. It feels more factual even. So well, what is like the one thing, if you want anybody to, or everybody who reads your book to get one thing out of it, what would that one thing be? The most important, what do you think is like your defining moment <laughs> for the book? No pressure. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, that's a big one. I think the number one thing is that you don't have to have a big business to have a good business. You can have your business. You know, it has to feel like you. Run your business by your own, you know, compass, your own North Star. Um, but definitely don't ignore some of the some of the directionals I give you in here <laughs> to help you create that star for yourself to follow. That's, I think, my, my one takeaway. Good answer. Love it. <laughs> Mary, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? Um, you know, I just want to recommend that everyone goes out and purchases this book. Um, even, especially even if you, again, like you said, even if you're a veteran and you've been in the floral business forever, um, I was just perusing this and what caught my eye too is you don't just talk about like, you, you cover everything really. You even talk about like photographing your flowers, which then translates to your brand, which no one ever really thinks about. But like Pinterest, again, like we say, Pinterest sells so many things and that means that people are visual people. So having those beautiful photos that you take of weddings is also going to really help you, you know, gain a stride in there. So I just really, I think, um, anyone who's starting, anyone who's already been in the business, who wants to keep growing their business, because as we've seen from 2020, if you don't adapt and keep growing, like you're gonna, you're gonna flop. Um, so now is really the time to start just gr growing, investing, learning. Um, so here's the book again, just so everyone can see it. You can get it on Amazon, correct? And I believe it is on Amazon. I haven't review. myself seen it there, but I believe it is on <laughs> Amazon. You can get it though at Flowers Review right through the Wildflower Media Bookshop called Falling Into Flowers. And my lovely step-by-step -step guide to today's modern wedding business. Um, people have told me they love the title falling into flowers. I'm like, I do too. It's totally my editor, Robin. I would have completely called it like how to be a wedding florist. Like I'm <laughs> very <laughs> much more like, here's the business. This is what it's about. Um, but I'm very, uh, I'm very, I love you holding it there. It's making me happy. So you <laughs> I feel and like guys, if you're watching this, we are going to do a giveaway of Allison's book. So we're going to have five available. Um, we will announce details on our Instagram and Facebook pages. So, but there will be some, just a few little hopes, hoops to jump through if you want to enter the giveaway. So we're going to do a sort of a like and share concept here. But again, keep an eye on Instagram and Facebook for that. Um, again, Allison, it's very thorough. It's very practical, which is probably my favorite thing about it is that everything feels realistic and actionable and it just it just makes sense so mary and i would highly recommend this book um we have loved talking to you about this and kind of getting to know your thought process and um and how you approach this project a little bit more it's been amazing thank you so much for having me and thanks for saying it's practical i always say i always joke and say i am nothing if not practical so <laughs> i <laughs> i appreciate that very much I think that might be my favorite part is just like, it just makes sense. And there's easy, actionable steps. It's not like this general concept that people kind of have to like figure out for themselves. You give them the steps to accomplish these goals. So I, that, that just, I, there's not really a better word for it. The practicality of it is, is remarkable. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And it's so funny that practical is like a huge compliment to me, but it is. <laughs> We always say, we always say, oh, I wish I had a book about this. Like, I wish someone just had a book. This is the book. So go pick it up because it is time to start streamlining. It is. Thank you guys so much for having me. It's so fun talking with you. And I look forward to doing it again. Yes, we can't wait. Thank you so much, Allison. We really appreciate your time. Anytime. My pleasure. <laughs>